Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, we are getting started with uh, Fit for Life and we're gonna do part two of chapter seven. Can everybody see the screen, uh, the slide I just put up? Okay, good. Yes. Well, let's open with prayer then. Heavenly Father, with joy and thanksgiving, we, we thank you that we can be together tonight online, studying your word, growing, learning a little bit, uh, so that as we go into daily life, even in these strange times, we will be better equipped to share the hope of Jesus with other people, because we'll be stronger and more confident in, in you, which is exactly what faith is all about. So bless us this night with uh, clear thinking. Uh, give us energy as we talk and converse and guide us into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, we talked about baptism the last time, and we talked about the means of grace. And just by way of review, uh, I will uh, just remind you that that is about um, me, the word means signifies or means a vehicle or a way, a conduit. And so God has these ways of getting grace to us. He, he loves to speak his words into our ears. And so when we read the Bible uh, or someone reads it to us or we hear a sermon preached or a Bible class, uh, then we get the chance to hear the word of God in our ears. And when we go to baptism, we saw this last week, that same word of the gospel is at work in water to give us new birth and new life. And uh, finally then, in uh, in the this means of grace here, the Lord's Supper, we're going to see that God takes bread and wine. And again, it's that same word of, of gospel, same word of mercy and forgiveness in Christ, uh, whereby God gives us uh, forgiveness of sins and so on. So that's what we'll look at today. Um, and you're going to want your Bible open to Exodus 12. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. So our first blank tonight, Jesus instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper in the context of the Passover meal. Oops. Went too fast there. Okay, so let's turn to Exodus 12. And Exodus is the second book of the Bible. And we're going to look at the 12th chapter. Now, the book, uh, the book of Exodus is about, strangely enough, the Exodus. And the Exodus is a, a Greek word that means kind of the way out or going out. And so it's the, the account of the Israelites going out of Egypt. They were slaves. God remembered his people. He brought them out of Egypt. Uh, there were all kinds of plagues that God did against the Egyptians because they refused to let Israel go. And then finally, they went through the Red Sea. And, and so here in chapter 12, we are just at the point where the people are just about getting ready to leave Egypt. They're, they're, in fact, they're going to leave the next morning. And so God institutes what was called the Passover meal. And we're just going to spend probably five or six minutes in here now reading about this because as our, our uh, number one says, it was the night of the Passover meal when all Israel remembered the Exodus that Jesus instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper. So, so we need the context. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, and we're at verse one of chapter 12, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. That's kind of an astounding thing, isn't it? When you think about it, God said, I'm going to change the calendar. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, imagine if um, one of our presidents, um, to make this less controversial, let's go back in time. <laughs> let's say that President Clinton, uh, years ago, it said July 1st is going to be our New Year's Day. July 1st, not January 1st. Well, we'd all scratch our heads and say, why would you do that? But uh, let's imagine that during the Cold War, it actually erupted into a hot war. There were you know, planes and tanks and bombs and the whole nine yards, Soviet Union against uh, NATO and all those allies. And let's imagine that the Soviet Union actually invaded the West Coast of the United States and was able to take the West Coast all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And then there was war for several years. And eventually the United States was able to push back the invaders and they left and a peace treaty was signed. Let's say they pushed them out back into, uh, you know, the Pacific and in June and on July 1, uh, a peace treaty was signed. Well, you can imagine then that that would have been such a momentous day and the United States had been invaded and, and had been and land had been captured for several years that July 1 then would kind of make sense, right? So I have to put you guys back on video because I, I can't see if you're sleeping or not when I don't have you on there. 
I, I had just me talking, which is a frightening thing. Okay, so that would make sense, right? If this all had happened, that July 1 would be the new New Year's. Well, what God is saying to all Israel, he's saying, we're going to make a new people. It's a new time in history for you. So this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So we're changing the calendar because this is going to change your identity. You're going to go from being slaves to free people. You're going to go to being the property of Egypt to the beloved possession of God. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So here's the directions. You get a lamb. Uh, what kind of a lamb should it be? It can be a sheep or a goat, but what, what kind of, a, of an animal should it be? You can unmute yourselves. It's fine. Male. Sheep. Okay, a male. And what else? Sheep. A sheep. Maybe a sheep or a goat. Without blemish. Without blemish. Yeah, and that's the important part of the thing. So not one that's, you know, missing an eye or, you know, the dog bit a hole in the ear or it limps around all the time. It's got to be perfect, unblemished, the, the best that you can have. Okay? And they get it on the 10th day, and then on the 14th day, uh, they slaughter it at twilight. Okay, verse 7. Uh, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. So here we got a, a picture. I'll move to the next image on our slide. And so uh, here on the left, now their houses probably weren't made of rock like this. And I always think the blood looks like silly putty, but let's move past that, okay? So here on the left side of the screen, we've got uh, the home of an Israelite who's living in Egypt, they're getting ready to leave, and they would put blood on the door frame of their house. Well, what would happen? That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire. So they're eating the, the, the body of the lamb, uh, along with bitter herbs. The bitter herbs were to remind them of the bitterness of slavery. And if you go to a Passover meal today, we've done a Christian Passover here at church many times, and you bite them and they're very bitter. And in fact, you dip them in salt water to remind you of the tears that were shed in Israel. Uh, and bread made without yeast because they're leaving quick. They don't have time to let the bread rise. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So does the Bible have fast food? Yes, it does. It's right here. Eat it in haste. This is fast food. Why do they have to eat it quickly, and why are they dressed with a cloak over them and a staff in their hand. What's happening the next morning? They're leaving. That's right. They're leaving. So this is road food. This is going through the drive through This is, hey, we, we're going to eat this quick. We're getting our food, and then we're out of here. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will, what does it say? Pass over you. That's how it gets its name. Pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And so the next morning they would leave. Verse 14. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Okay, so there's lots more in that chapter, but that's enough for our purpose tonight. So Jesus could have instituted the Lord's Supper on any night he wanted, but he did it on Passover night. Why? Well, uh, turn in your Bibles now to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Third uh, gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And chapter 9 is the account of the transfiguration of Jesus. And it's verse 28. 
chapter 9 of Luke, verse 28. So find Luke, and then find the ninth chapter, and then find verse 28. All right, here we go. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So this is a really amazing event. Peter, James, and John were in awe. Moses and Elijah appear, and they're talking with Jesus about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So what do you think Jesus was about to do at Jerusalem? What's the big event of all the Gospels? I can't hear you. What's the big event at the end of the Gospels? This is the easiest question I'll ask you all night long. The crucifixion. That's right. And? And? And resurrection. That's right. We dare not forget that, right? If he just dies, it's then we're wasting our time and I got to go watch the football game, right? So Jesus died and then he rose from the dead. That's what they're talking about. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are talking about what he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And it says there they spoke about his departure. But do you know what the Greek word is when you read this in, in the Greek text? It says they spoke about his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment. At Jerusalem. That's awesome, isn't it? Because what does Jesus do? So let's look at the Israelites. Again, the left side of the screen, they're in their homes, they're getting ready to leave. God is going to take on their enemies, the Egyptians. They travel out of Egypt. They go to the Red Sea. The army comes after them. God opens the Red Sea. They go through it, and all their enemies are drowned. When they come out the water on the other side, they're no longer slaves, but now they're the people of God. And he takes them to Mount Sinai, and they're there just, just a couple months later, and he gives them a covenant. You know, we would call it like a book, right? And that's the first part of the Old Testament. He gives them the covenant, this relationship. It's in writing. And when they're there, and I don't have time to give you all these Bible verses, so you just have to come to church for a few years. You'll get all this stuff. But in Exodus 24, while they're on the mountain, uh, representatives of the people of Israel come, about 70 of them, along with Moses, and they kill a bull, and they take some of the blood and sprinkle it on the people, and they take some of the blood and pour it on the altar, and Moses says, this is the blood of the covenant, right? So I just gave you a ton of information really fast, I know that, but I hope some of it will sink into your minds and you'll remember, okay? Sinking in. All right, now, let's go into the future. For us, it's still the past, but here's Jesus. He could have picked any night of the year to institute what we call the Lord's Supper. But he picks this night. He picks Passover. And what does he do? Well, he takes bread, right? And we'll look at, read these words in it. He takes bread. He breaks it. And he gives it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body. Now, what, what body did they eat back in Exodus 12? It was the body of a lamb. What is Jesus called in the New Testament? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then Jesus takes a cup. And he shares it among the disciples, and he says, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. He's using almost exactly the same language as back in Exodus 24. And he says, for the forgiveness of sins. And, and so it, here's this, and he's about to go the next day. He'll be killed, and then three days later, he'll rise from the dead. And that's his exodus. And so he's freeing a people from their sins, from death from the power of Satan, by his death and resurrection. And so in that meal, we get all this good stuff. Is that awesome or what? I mean, it's incredible. And, and so when you start looking at the parallels, it's, it's really amazing. All right, so we'll look at some of those now as we fill in some blanks uh, in our study book. So number two, Jesus connected his word of forgiveness to the elements of bread and wine. So I'll pop uh, Matthew 26 on the screen here, because I, I spent a lot of time in Exodus 12. So while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, he declared that his body and blood are truly present, or really present, 
in the bread and wine for us to eat and drink. Now, I just showed you Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Right? So you got really present in there. Now I'm going to show you each of the next verses. And we'll look up 1 Corinthians here in just a minute. So Mark 14, what does Jesus say? Can you guys see my mouse when it moves? Okay, so look here. Take it. This is my body. And then verse 24, this is my blood. Let's go back to Luke 22. What do we see here? This is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. They all say this. And then finally, we get to 1 Corinthians 11. This is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's almost as if my head's kind of thick and God has to pound it in there over and over and over. So I get it. Okay. So let's take a look now. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. And I want to work through that passage as well. I wish I could give you page numbers, but I can't. And again, if you're watching this online and I talk too fast, just pause the video, look up the Bible verse, and then you can, uh, you can catch up and start the, the, uh, the video again. Okay, so if we look at 1 Corinthians 11, we'll start at verse 23. <laughs> Google thought I was talking to it. I was trying to look up 1 Corinthians 11 for me on my phone. Go to sleep. Back to sleep. Good phone. All right. Verse, uh, verse 23 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul writing. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Uh, you know what? Let, let's just hang on to that for a minute. We're going to come back to that. So leave your Bible open there. I'm going to cover a little bit more ground before I, I get there because I've got a little chart that I can show you as well. How this can be is a mystery that we embrace rather than say more or less than what the Bible says. Let me see here. All right. In the Lord's Supper, as in baptism, God's word of forgiveness becomes a visible word for you personally. Okay, so let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11, and we're verse 23. Um, for, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we're going to work through these verses a little bit, because there are different teachings about the Lord's Supper, depending on uh, what what different denominations teach about the Lord's Supper, okay? And I, the reason I'm stalling here a little bit is I, I've used this Bible class many times, and they've, in this last revision, they took a little bit of stuff out, which I'm kind of sad about, so I'm going to talk, talk my way through it here. So Roman Catholicism teaches uh, that in the Lord's Supper, when, when the priest speaks the words of institution, which are the words that Jesus said, right? So this is my body, this is my blood. Those are called the words of institution or sometimes called consecration. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that when those words are spoken by the priest, bread and wine are gone, and all that's left is the body and blood of Christ. That's it. Now, it looks like bread, it looks like wine, it smells like bread, it smells like wine, but it's not actually there. It's only the body and blood of Christ. Now, if we stopped in our Bible's reading, and remember, I just read this to you, uh, this is my body. If we stop there, we might say, well, it kind of seems to be what the Bible's teaching, so maybe they're right. And so let's go to the next verse. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So again, if we stop there, we might agree with Roman Catholicism, which teaches it's only the body and only the blood of Christ. Now, we don't stop there, do we? We keep reading because we're Bible students. That's what Bible students do. Look at verse 26. For whenever you eat this, what does it say? Bread. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, what's in the cup? Wine. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And, and so you're definitely eating bread and you're definitely drinking wine there. 
Now, there are another group of denominations. Uh, typically, they're called Reformed. It's a large group of denominations, but we could say maybe Baptist or Nazarene or Church of Christ, those kinds of denominations. They teach that you only have bread and wine. The body and blood of Christ are not present, and, and the bread and wine represent or symbolize the body and blood of Christ, but the body and blood of Christ are not actually there. Okay? So if we just read verse 20, what did I just read there? Verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And again, you might say, well, I can see maybe how they get symbolization out of that. Um, sorry, symbol, symbolism. I just made up a word. Therefore, look at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So what do we have here? What the Bible seems to be teaching us is that you have bread and wine, but you also have the body and blood of Christ. Now, to further support that, turn back one chapter, so maybe just a page in your Bible or, or so, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's look at verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And that's about that's about as plain as, as it can be said, right? So when I when I uh, drink from the cup of thanksgiving, in other words, when I drink the wine, I'm I'm having a participation in the blood of Christ. When I eat the bread, I am participating, I'm receiving the body of Christ. And so during the, the Reformation, Martin Luther and other reformers said it really well. When, when the Bible teaches something, we take it at its plain value, unless there's something there to help us realize that's not its plain value. And there's no indication here in 1 Corinthians 10 or chapter 11 or in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, that when Jesus says, take eat, this is my body, or this is my blood, that he means anything other than that. There's no, there's no parable like Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a farmer who went out to sow his seed. There's, there's no symbolic representational language either. Okay? So any questions about that before we move on? Any, any stuff I said that was confusing or didn't make sense or you don't like or anything like that? Okay, wow. It's just, you know, what we try to do is let the Bible interpret the Bible and take it in the simplest sense that, that we can. Now, one of the reasons that we do this kind of a class and have some instruction is what we see in first, back in 1 Corinthians 11 now, verse 28, where it says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So they died. Uh, fall, fallen asleep is a euphemism for death there. So what's going on here? What, what God is saying here, I believe this teaches us, that Jesus is saying, in fact, that I'm present there in a very unique way. My body and blood are present in this, in this meal, in this sacrament. And so I should examine myself before I go and recognize I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. And number two, if I don't recognize the body of the Lord, if I don't recognize that the body and blood of Christ are actually present here, I, I could be eating and drinking judgment on, on myself. And, and in this context, there are actually people who died because of that. Now, I, I think this is another layer of support for what, what we call in the Lutheran church, the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in, in this sacrament. If you go back in the Old Testament, and maybe you haven't read this, maybe you have, but there were a few times when people went into the presence of God and they hadn't been asked to come, and they died. For example, you know about Moses. Well, his brother's name was Aaron, and Aaron was the first high priest of Israel. He had four sons. Two of them decided that they would do the high priest's job, their dad's job, and they went into the uh, the tent of meeting where the Ark of the Covenant was, and yes, think Indiana Jones, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark. And they went in there 
without God asking them to come. And they, they were going to go in and burn incense before the Lord. In other words, they went right into the Lord's presence, but not in the way he had asked them to. Not the high priest, Aaron, but his sons. And they died. It says fire came out and consumed them. Later on, when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured, it was eventually sent back to Israel. And it was being transported in an ox cart. And the oxen stumbled, and the Ark of the Covenant began to fall, and a man reached out his hand to steady it, and he died because of that. Now, when I was a kid, that verse made me mad. Why did God do that? He was just trying to help. But, but when you read about how the Ark of the Covenant was to be transported, where God's special place where he says, I will be present here to forgive the sins of Israel, the priests were supposed to carry it on poles, and here it is coming in an ox cart. I mean, think of it this way. Uh, if uh, if the president of the United States is going to have dinner at your house, he's going to arrive right in a in a limousine or or like they call it the beast, right? This bulletproof car or uh, a black SUV, right? But but how would the president feel? If he said, "Oh yeah, I'll pick you up," and you came out maybe with your your tractor and uh, and you had like a little cart behind it, and there was like ox. They were pooping in the road, you know, and you went over that in your tractor. I mean, come on. And so God is saying, you have no respect for me whatsoever. And so that happened in the Old Testament. And here again, we have the presence of God being disrespected. And what does God say? Well, there needs to be respect. And there isn't. So some people died. Okay? So this is not to scare you away from the Lord's Supper. It's actually to help you realize what's there. With bread and wine, I eat, along with bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ. Why? What does Jesus say? For the forgiveness of my sins. So it's all good, but it's good. It's a meal for the family. Uh, it's a meal of understanding. Uh, when you have a baby, right, you would not take that baby and feed it. Well, I mentioned bacon earlier. You wouldn't give bacon to your one month old, right? That would be a disaster. <laughs> but when that child grows up and is ready to eat it, then yeah. And in the same way, a, a person who has just become a Christian or isn't a Christian for that matter. You would not give this meal to them because they're not ready for it. And that's why we do this class. That's one of the reasons. And it's why we do this instruction. Okay. I'm going to move on. But if you have a question or comment, please, uh, please let me know. So, Pastor, yes. um, under transubstantiation, I like saying that because I grew up Catholic. So I kind of know what it is. <laughs> um, am I take, if I go into a Catholic church and I take communion, since it, is under transubstantiation according to Catholic doctrine. Now the body and blood. Am I taking communion unworthily? Well, to me, that that's actually a different issue. Um, the one issue is what is it? Now the Roman Catholics at least are teaching that the body and blood of Christ are present, right? Uh, and that's good. Um, they're saying there is no bread and there is no wine. And I would say, then you're missing part of what the Bible teaches. And that's not so good. But again, turn back to 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, I wasn't going to really jump into this, but you brought it up. It's a great question. So, so let's do that. 1 Corinthians 10. We just read verse 16. So um, let's pick up at verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So What's this little section talking about? It's talking about unity. We are united here. Why? Because we're eating one loaf, the body of Christ. Now let's continue. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? So if you were an Israelite in the Old Testament, you would go to a worship at the tabernacle or the temple, and you would bring a sacrifice. Let's say it was a goat, and you would kill that goat, maybe for a sin offering or something like that. And then you would eat it. That was part of your worship. The priest often would get some of that food to take home to his family, or he might eat it there. But it was part of the worship service. And by the way, that was also common in the sacrifices and the, and the worship services of some of the Greek gods of the day that Paul writes this. Okay? So he says, do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? So what about these, you know, the temple of Zeus or the temple of Aphrodite? Are there true gods there? Paul says, no, but verse 20, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. And so what, what is happening there, the 
No. Just you... tap the search tip below. <laughs> I don't want Google to search the web for that. I don't know why she's listening to me so well. She ignores me at other times. All right. So um, anyways, so uh, what Paul is saying here is know that those there's no true gods in those idols, but there are demons, false gods, fallen angels that spread false teaching around the world. And so Paul says, you, you can't go to the temple of Zeus or the temple of Apollo and, and eat there as part of the worship and then come to the Lord's table. So, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for the Lord's Supper. Because you're worshiping different gods, so to speak. You've got the true God, and then you've got demons. And so uh, he says in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And so you can't go to those places. Now, turn ahead in your Bible to 1 Timothy. It's just a few books, like six books farther along. So it's First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy. So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And again, I'm sorry, I can't give you page numbers. And again, pause the video. If you're watching this online, you need to look it up. 1 Timothy 4. Uh, Timothy is a young kind of apostolic assistant. He's like a, a young pastor. And so Paul's giving him instruction. Verse 1 of chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith, and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. There's those demons again. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. Think about that. So demons don't stand on the street corner looking all scary with, they're all black and hideous, or, or they're not running around with pointy ears and pitchforks, right? Where do these teachings come from or come through? Hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now think about that. What is the Bible saying here? The Bible is saying it's a demonic teaching to do what? Forbid people to marry, right? Any church bodies out there forbidding people to marry? There you go, Brian, right? That's Roman Catholicism. They forbid their priests and their nuns to marry. Now, of course, they say, it's a vow you voluntarily take if you want to become a priest, but you can't become a priest without taking that vow. And how's that worked out? Has that worked out pretty well? Yeah, it hasn't worked out well at all, has it? I mean, how many cases of sexual misconduct, sexual abuse have, have just swirled around the Roman Catholic clergy because of this? It's a terrible, terrible burden they shouldn't have to carry. And they do. And the Bible says that's a demonic teaching. Uh, how about forbidding people to abstain from certain foods? Are there are there denominations and religions that teach that? You better believe it, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, Judaism, uh, Islam, say no pork. Seventh-day Adventism follows along with those Old Testament teachings and says you shouldn't eat those foods that are that are prohibited in the Old Testament. You know, sorry, we have a New Testament. We can eat whatever we, we want. You know, we can. Jesus said that. Paul says that. Uh, and, and so these are demonic teachings. Now, why are they demonic? Not just because maybe they cause bad, bad results, but because they pull away from Jesus. You know, if I'm worried about, if I eat certain foods, that makes me a better Christian. What am I worried about? I'm worried about my good works. I'm not thinking about Jesus makes me the best Christian I can in his eyes. Yeah, I got stuff to work on, but I'm not making myself better by not eating pork. I'm not making myself better if I remain single. Only Jesus can make me pure in God's eyes. So why, why should I mess with this stuff? That's why it's demonic. It pulls away from Christ crucified and risen. And so, Brian, to, to get back to your question then, when I have visited different churches, and uh, I'm blessed to have a sabbatical at this church every so many years, and I visit Lutheran churches, but I also go to other denominations. I want to see what's going on out there. But I don't commune. And why is that? Because, well, back to 1 Corinthians 10, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. I'm not saying they're not Christians at these different denominational churches. There's some wonderful Christians in Roman Catholic churches and Presbyterian churches and Baptist churches. There's some marvelous Christians there. But what they confess, what they teach about marriage, about the Lord's Supper, uh, about a whole host of other teachings, I, I can't agree with. I said, no, no, no. And, and so we're not one body. We're not one loaf because we don't have nearly the same confession 
And so that's why I don't commune at, a, at different denominations. And I would encourage you to strongly consider doing the same. Um, you know, wait till you come back home to your home church or wait till you find a, a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregation, because they, they confess and teach the same things we do. Does that make sense to you guys? Sort of, kind of. Yes, Lars gives me the thumbs up. Great. Thanks for having I me. Ate a, tonight, Lars, appreciate it. I ate a lot of filet of fish sandwiches on Fridays during Lent because <laughs> you couldn't have meat on yeah. Fridays during Lent. You know, I bickered in Michigan, as I said, on Sunday, and there's tons of Lutheran churches and there's tons of Roman Catholic churches. I went to some great fish fries on Fridays, I tell you. <laughs> they were awesome. You get that Lake Michigan fresh perch. Oh, man, that's good stuff. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts about that before we go on? No? Okay, jump on in if you need to. All right, now there are some biblical reasons that might keep someone from the Lord's Supper, an unwillingness to repent. We looked earlier at the verse that said that a person, man or a woman, a person should examine himself or herself. So what does that mean? The, the Greek word there kind of has to do with a balance scale. And so when I weigh myself, when I weigh myself against the word of God, I come up short, don't I? And so I have to repent and say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. Uh, but if I'm unwilling to do that, and I, I don't think I need forgiveness, well, then I, then I shouldn't go to the Lord's Supper. Let her be an unwillingness to forgive others. What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Right? So if, uh, if uh, Brian has sinned against me, and I'm really ticked off at him, and I, I'm not going to forgive that jerk, then I should not go to the Lord's Supper. How can I go to the Lord's Supper and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this forgiveness. It's wonderful, but I ain't forgiven him. You know, that's just, that's hypocrisy, isn't it? Letter C, failure to recognize that Christ's body and blood are present in the bread and wine. We don't want to give, as a pastor, I don't want to give anything uh, to, to anyone who might not know what they're doing, because that could bring judgment on them. And finally, letter D, if someone is not prepared to examine himself, and that's very familiar to um, to the uh, repentance aspect of letter A, okay? So what I want to encourage you to think about here, and I get this question a lot, what if I did something really bad this week? Then by all means, come, run to the table. And in our case, it's run, run to the uh, entrance of the church on Sunday mornings when we're outside. But you know, that's what should make you come. Because when you know you've sinned, it's like, oh, I, 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 would, I was so bad this week. I said this or did that or I didn't do this. That's when you should come. And, and when you feel guilty is when you should come. And I have had people over the years who feel they feel guilty so they don't come. That's, that's not the right approach. And by the way, I think last time I talked about our hymnals, I'm going to do it again tonight, two weeks in a row. In our hymnals, in the front part... Here we are. So I don't know if you can see the page numbers, but it's page 329. Okay, I'm going to get you guys to buy a hymnal, right? So Merry Christmas, you know, Christmas idea for you. Um, there's a section for preparation before you go to the Lord's Supper. And I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest you do this every week, but I find I do it a few times a year. It's very helpful because I, I get kind of forgetful or maybe lazy. I don't think about this all the time. And you can do this Saturday night before you come to church. It's just a bunch of questions, just about two pages. Uh, it's called Christian Questions with Their Answers. And you can look it up online, I'm sure, and print it out. But it's a great way to get ready for the Lord's Supper before you go. And uh, I'll just read to you the last part of it. Uh, question 20. What should you do if you are not aware of this need and have no hunger and thirst for the sacrament? <laughs> to such a person, no better advice can be given than this. First, did he touch his body to see if he still has flesh and blood? Then he should believe what the scriptures say of it in Galatians 5 and Romans 7. And if you look those up, it talks about how we keep on sinning. Second, he should look around to see whether he is still in the world. And remember that there will be no lack of sin and trouble, as the scriptures say in John 15 to 16 and 1 John 2 and 5. Third, he will certainly have the devil also around him, who with his lying and murdering day and night will let him have no peace within or without, as the scriptures picture him in John 8 and 16, 1 Peter 5, Ephesians 6, and 2 Timothy 2. So that's kind of how Luther writes. I mean, he is just frank and kind of in your face. 
But it's a great way to get ready for the Lord's Supper. So I, I commend that to your use. Uh, and finally, then, we can end with this, uh, this little uh, bullet point. We thank and praise our Savior, who knows how important it is for us to have these external means to experience his grace and forgiveness. So when, when, you, when you need mercy, when you need forgiveness, when you need grace, you go to the means of grace. Read your Bible, especially the gospel promises. Listen to a gospel-centered sermon. Come to church, confess your sins, and receive forgiveness. Remember that you are baptized and read some of the verses about baptism. Go to the Lord's Supper and receive forgiveness. They're just treasures that every Christian should take advantage of. All right, any questions about the Lord's Supper or even baptism or anything else? No? Going? Going? Gone. Okay. Let me go back. We'll start lesson eight here. And we got about 45 minutes to do that. Okay. Okay, let's see. Share the screen. You guys have it? Yes, I can't hear you, so you have to nod big. Okay, good. Oh, I got the thumbs up, right? All right. So what we're going to do the next couple of units, and we we might get it all done this week and next, but they're really long, so it might even take us three Mondays or two and a half, I guess. Um, we're going to go through the Ten Commandments, and uh, we'll talk about all of them. And I always like uh, to preface this by saying, when we go through the Ten Commandments, every one of us, and that includes me, I'm, I'm first in line with you guys, every one of us is going to get to one of these commandments and feel shame, right? I did this when I was younger, or I did this last week, or, you know, the, the filth that came out of my mouth, or uh, a sexual sin from the past, or, or the way I hurt a family member, or whatever it may be. So I want you to know one of the reasons I think that, that the authors of this put the Ten Commandments toward the end is to make sure that you are solidly resting in the grace of God. So when your Heavenly Father looks at you, remember, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so you don't have to worry about your salvation. You don't have to think that God hates you. Do these commandments sometimes make us feel guilty? Yeah. And sometimes I need that. Sometimes I need to be reminded that I'm a sinner and I'm a really good sinner. I'm not so often a good Christian sometimes. And so I need that. It's good for me. It makes me humble. But, but before we get into any of the commandments, I want to remind you, you are covered by the righteousness of Christ. Okay? So that's my preface. So we're going to talk about the law. Uh, there are different uses of God's law. Letter A, as a curb. So when you're driving, remember when you were first learning to drive your car? And you, 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 uh, you wanted to go into like the parking lot at 7-Eleven, get something to drink or something. And you're with your friends and you're like, I'm driving. Look at me. And what did you do? Bam, into the curb, right? And it was very embarrassing. I mean, I'm just speaking hypothetically here. So a curb hits the car tire or the car tire hits it really hard. And some of it can even knock you back. And so that's one use of God's law. It's like, don't do that. Great example of this. Let's say it's tomorrow. It's uh, you're going to have um, an appointment at, at one o'clock. You're going to your doctor's office. And if you're like me, I always think I get one more thing done before I leave. And so I regularly leave late. So you leave late and you're going down Highway 50. And let's say it's in Folsom and you're leaving the Camera Park area and you're going down to Folsom. And you're ripping along because you're late. And the speed limit says 65 and you're doing let's just say more than 75. How about we say that, okay? And you're, you're coming around, maybe you're going to, uh, oh, let's say that big hill that goes, at, right? El Dorado Hills into Full Speed, you go up the hill and you're coming down and you are screaming, baby. And, and right at the top of the hill on the right side, you see a black and white vehicle with a nice seal on the door. What do you do? Man, you are slamming on the brakes. Now, why are you slamming on the brakes? It's because you love Jesus so much, isn't it? No, it's because the law is a curb and you're going, I don't want to have a $260 fine to pay for my ticket. That's why you slow down. 
And so that's a great example of the law being used as a curb. It stops your behavior because you're afraid of the punishment. And that's a good thing, right? Think of how much crime would be committed if we thought there were no consequences. Uh, if you've watched the news now, I'm, I'm getting up there in years. And I can remember in the 1970s, there was a huge blackout in New York. And what did people do? They went to the, the TV stores, the electronic stores. They threw rocks through the windows and everybody started stealing TVs. Were these hardened criminals? No, they were the people living in the apartments right next to the electronic store. But it was dark. There was no security. There was no electricity. And they stole TVs. So the law as a curb is a good thing. Letter B, as a mirror, it shows us our sin. So that's one of the hard things about these Zoom meetings, right? As I look, I, look, I can look right now and see myself. Now, in my mind, I'm much younger looking, but not in real life. In my mind, I'm like 30, but my body is not 30. Let's just say it that way. And so the law is like that. It, it's so accurate in the way it reflects us. And so when you when you go through the Ten Commandments, it says, uh, for example, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You know, and if I use a bad word, if I use God's name in vain, uh, what am I doing? I'm sinning. And, and the Bible says, mirror, let me show you exactly what you look like. And there's no fake in the mirror out. Okay, that's the second use. And the third use is as a guide. It helps Christians respond to the love of God. How should I live? What should I do? So a curb, a mirror, and a guy. And I got a fun little cartoon here. I always like this one. So the curb there is keeping him from going on his, what is that, five or 10-wheeled rollerblades? That's amazing. Um, and, and the curb is keeping him in, in the street where he should stay. The, the mirror is showing him what he looks like. And then the sign says, go this way. So that's the law. It's a curb, it's a mirror, and it's a guy. Now, when we get into the Old Testament, we'll talk about that first. There are different kinds of law in the Old Testament. So there were ceremonial laws, and those laws govern the Old Testament sacrificial system. Now, if you go back and read Numbers or Leviticus, for example, uh, you can read that parts of Numbers and parts uh, most of Leviticus, and it's really tedious because it has instruction after instruction. So if you commit this sin, you shall take you know this much grain and offer it as a peace offering or Take this animal and offer it as a sin offering. And it's got all these instructions. There's even instructions in there about, you know, well, there's other kind of law. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, so the, these laws talked about how you should worship God. Now, I'm going to pop Colossians 2, 16, 17 on the screen. Uh, you know what? I'm actually going to make you look it up because this is so important. So if you're in 1 Corinthians, just go forward a couple books. First and se second, first Corinthians, second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So I guess you go forward about five books. Go to Colossians chapter two. This is really important stuff. And we'll start at verse 13. Colossians 2, verse 13. And if you guys need to stand up and stretch while I'm talking, you've been sitting for almost an hour. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Now, we looked at Colossians 2 last week about baptism, which is verses 11 and 12. Now we're going to pick up at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Now look what verse 14 says. Having canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us. So that written code is canceled. Why? Uh, that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And so Jesus lives the perfect life that we can't live. He goes to the cross and offers that perfect life on behalf of us and all people who have sinned. And so because the law is completely fulfilled, it's canceled, right? All the requirements of the Old Testament law are fulfilled in Jesus. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So did you guys know that the, well, I'll ask it as a trivia question to keep you guys engaged. See this teaching technique I'm doing now, right? I'm asking questions, right? Who knows what the name Satan means? What's the meaning of the name Satan? Anybody know? Devil? Nope. That's a good guess though. Devil means uh, uh, slanderer. Is that the what? accuser? Yes. Good job, Laura Lee. It means accuser. 
And so what does Satan accuse us of? Before God. Did you know in the Old Testament, Satan actually is allowed in the presence of God and he accuses God's people of sins? Uh, I don't have time to show examples, but they're there. It's fascinating stuff. And so Satan accuses us before God and says, see those people, God, they're such sinners. Look what they did. And what does it say here in Colossians 2? It says Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities. What can Satan accuse us of if Jesus died of all, for all of our sins? Nothing. He can accuse us of nothing. And so he's disarmed. All he can do now is lie and try to make us afraid. So now here comes the big therefore, right? So Jesus did this. He canceled the written code and he disarmed Satan. So verse 16, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. So all of these things were written about in the old laws, right? Of the, of the Old Testament. Don't eat pork. Don't eat shellfish. Don't eat rabbits. Worship on the seventh day. Remember uh, these different festivals, tabernacles, Passover, and so on. And, and so Paul says, nobody can judge you on those things anymore. Verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So this is a very profound little, little section of verses. So the reality is found in Christ. So uh, we did the Passover already, right? We did that uh, 45 minutes ago. So the Passover... You had a lamb sacrifice. Did, did the lamb forgive the sins of the families that killed it? No. Who only was able to die and forgive the sins of the world? Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the Passover pointed ahead to Jesus. It was a great meal. And, and when people trusted in the promise of God, they received forgiveness. But that promise pointed to Jesus, not to the lamb. The lamb couldn't bring forgiveness. Okay? And think about circumcision, right? Well. You know, circumcision, Colossians 2, 11, has been replaced by baptism. Because Christ is the one who circumcises our hearts. Cutting off part of our bodies doesn't forgive us, but Jesus can forgive us, right? All the dietary laws, they focused on making you different, set apart. You're not like the other nations. But they couldn't actually set us apart, but Jesus sets us apart through faith in him. So does this all make sense? Yes? Any questions? Oh, thank you, Lars. Yes. So now the reason I'm kind of stressing this, I'm wanting to make sure this makes sense, is because we're going to run through all these commandments, and, and you're going to have to go back to this over and over and over again. For example, we'll, we probably will have time tonight to get to the third commandment. There is a Christian denomination that still teaches you have to worship on Saturday. Why don't we? Because of what we just read here. Worshiping on Saturday didn't make me holy, but Christ makes every day holy, right? You see the difference? And so we're going we're gonna to run through all this stuff. All right, stop me if you need to. The political social law governs civil affairs for the Jews as a theocratic nation. So this is how do we behave? What are the rules and laws and so forth? And it was very specific. I'm going to pop this verse up here. Check this out. I bet you guys didn't know this was in the Bible. Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. How many of you thought the word excrement was in the Bible before you came to class tonight, right? <laughs> it's in there. Okay. So those were the civil laws. So, uh, and they applied to the Jews as long as God had a political nation on earth. But he doesn't have a political nation on earth anymore. Jesus came and he said, no, Israel is much bigger than just the Hebrews, the Jews. Israel is everyone who trusts in me. I don't have a political nation with geographical boundaries anymore. I have a nation around the globe. And so these political and civil laws, again, don't apply to us anymore because God does not have a kingdom in Israel with borders. And that's shocking for a lot of Christians, by the way. Do, I, do you want me to kind of reinforce that a little bit with some, some Bible verses? Okay, let me do that, because a lot of Christians will still say, oh, the Jews are the chosen people of God. Not according to Paul, Jesus, or John the Baptist. Other than that, it's true, right? So 
I'm going to run you through some Bible passage. You might go kind of quick. Uh, Matthew 3. So uh, turn to Matthew 3, first book of the New Testament. So in Matthew 3, we have John the baptizer doing his thing. We're going to hear from him on Sunday uh, as we worship together from Mark. We're reading Matthew tonight. Uh, all kinds of people, verse 5 of chapter 3, people went out from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. I always wanted to start a sermon that way. I never had the courage. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So what is John the Baptist saying? He's saying, your heritage means nothing if you think that simply because you're born into Israel, you're automatically part of the people of God. Right? Do you see that? Make sense? Okay. Now turn. We're going to go three Gospels ahead. Matthew, Mark, Luke to John. John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, Jesus has a very lengthy dispute with those who, uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders who opposed him. So we'll look at John 8, and we'll look at verse 38. So it's about the middle of the chapter. John 8, verse 38. So there's this, again, this long argument, I guess you could call it that. Jesus said in verse 38, I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. And then look at the end of that little paragraph, verse 47. Jesus said, he who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. And you can't say it any plainer, can you? These were Hebrews. These were Jews. Were they part of the people of God? No. Jesus says clearly, no. So just because you're a Jewish person does not make you part of the people of God. And finally, then, we'll look at Paul. And let's see, um, a good verse for that would be, um, there's several. We're, we're in Colossians. So go back a couple books to Galatians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So go back to Galatians chapter 3. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, verse 26. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So who is part of Israel? Who are part of God's people? Those who trust in Christ. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. What matters is God came, he showed himself, and he said, I'm, I'm the Messiah if you trust in him. Does that help a little bit? It's a little strange to hear that, isn't it? Because in our country, we hear a lot of preachers saying the Jews are always going to be the chosen people of God. Now, they will from God's perspective. But for those who, who turn away from God, who ignore him, who reject Jesus, they're not part of the chosen people anymore. They've lost their salvation, which is really tragic. So this in no way is to make us feel smug or, or arrogant. 
but really should just drive us to share the gospel of Christ with Jew and Gentile whenever we can. Okay? Stop me if you have questions. Otherwise, I'm rolling. Uh, letter C, the moral law is the unchanging law of God seen most clearly in the Ten Commandments. And so the moral law, just because God got rid of the, the written code of the Old Testament doesn't mean that God doesn't care about human behavior. He does. And so when we look in the Ten Commandments, do we have to worship on the, on the Saturday, on the seventh day of the week? No. But does God still want us to worship? Yes. So how do we understand the Ten Commandments? We start with not the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. We start with the New Testament, and then we run backwards. So again, I'll use baptism as an example. Why is it that we don't practice, or well, we don't require circumcision for Christians? Because we go to the New Testament, the New Covenant, where it says that baptism has replaced circumcision, and that's in Colossians chapter 2. And so we don't have to follow the Old Testament law of, of circumcision. But does God still want a circumcised heart? You bet he does. And so we do what God commands us in the New Testament, which is baptism. Hopefully this is getting more and more clear the more I repeat myself, okay? I'm going to skip the cartoon. I'm going to skip that. Okay. Now, when we look at the, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, Jesus defined the two tables of the law, or tablets, as love to God and love to neighbor. So we'll look at Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Uh, this is where Jesus is asked a question. What's the, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? And here's what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so when you look at the Ten Commandments, and they're numbered differently by different religious groups, because the Old Testament doesn't actually tell us which ten are the ten, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But they're divided into two parts. And you just see Jesus holding the two tablets, and on tablet number one, you see a triangle. That's a symbol for the Trinity. So it's, you shall have no other gods. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day. And then the second tablet, a table of the law, begins with, on your father and mother. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal. All the commandments that deal with our relationship with other people. So if you have to summarize the law, it's love God, love your neighbor. Simple, right? Right, Lars? Simple? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this moral law, in other words, that God still wants worship and he still wants people to behave in a, in a good moral fashion, it's not optional. Uh, or relative to the situation. Okay, I got it. I haven't told you a bad joke all night. This was actually kind of funny, I think. Um, so uh, maybe you've heard me tell it. So if you have, I'm sorry. So there's this traveling salesman, and he drives on country roads, kind of like Highway 49. You know, when you get out of El Dorado, you go to 49. I love driving down there in about March or April. Everything's green. It's so beautiful. And he drives down a country road like that, and he drives by this farm all the time, and he, and he sells farm equipment and stuff like that. Well, on one of these days, uh, oh, and by the way, every time he drives by, he can see the barn. And on the barn, there's all these targets and there's arrows shot right into the bullseye. I mean, it's amazing. And one day, the salesman has a cancellation. He's got an extra two hours to burn. And he's driving by this barn and he goes, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. So he goes out and he knocks on the farmhouse door. And the farmer comes out and, and the salesman says, you know, um, Sorry to bother you, but I've driven by this, this farm for years, and I've noticed you are a very good shot uh, with your bow and arrow. W would you show me how you do that? And the farmer's kind of a little embarrassed, but he's proud. And so he goes, sure. So they go out to the barn, and, and the farmer goes into the barn, and he brings out his, his bow, and he has a couple of arrows with him. And, and he takes careful aim at, at the barn, and he lets loose an arrow. And he doesn't say anything. And he walks into the barn and he comes out with a can of paint and he paints a bullseye right around the arrow that he just shot. Now, I love that story because it shows uh, how the guy was not really a good shot, but he, he painted the target around his arrow to make himself look good. And that's what this little phrase is about here, number two, uh, that, that we often behave a certain way and then we explain why we, why we do it. And, and if you ever watch like um, politicians running for office, you know, I, I, would, I would tremble with fear if I ever did that because 
I know they're going to go Google me and dig up my past. It's like, ah, I don't, I don't want that out. Right. And, and so uh, politicians will do that very thing. They'll paint a new bullseye. I say, well, the reason I did that was such and such and such and such. And because of this situation, that's why I did what I did. End of story. And, and, and God can't be fooled, right? God can't be deceived. And, and so Jesus wants us uh, to live in a very moral fashion, good moral fashion. Okay, so here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Turn in your Bible to Exodus 20. Second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus. And we will turn to chapter 20. Now, I want you to notice, uh, if you have a Bible, most Bibles have what's called a hanging indent. So they, they stick the, the starting part of the paragraph out a little bit. Like, for example, do you see that verse 3? The, the, the words you, the word you sticks out farther than the rest of the paragraph. You, so most of your Bibles will probably have that. And what the translators are trying to do is help us to see where the commandments are, right? So you look at verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. They're saying, that's the first of the Ten Commandments. Well, verse 4 has the same thing, right? So they're saying that's the next commandment. And then verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 12 and verse 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on, right? So, but you got to remember, that's not in the Hebrew text. That's, that's an English translation trying to help us figure out what the commandments are. And you'll notice if, if you grow, grew up as a Lutheran or Brian said he grew up as a Roman Catholic, Verse four is not a commandment in our catechisms by itself. You shall make, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything, right? Wood or anything like that. We believe that that goes right with verse three. You shall have no other gods. Well, of course you wouldn't make something, right? It's one commandment. But if you look now down to verse 17, you shall not cover your neighbor's house. You should not cover your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant. And so, in many Lutheran Roman Catholic catechisms, that's made into two cat, uh, commandments. You should not cover your neighbor's house, so where he lives. And then and then the next one is his wife, man, so remains, you know, his, his family or, or people. So that gets divided. But that doesn't really make sense either, does it? So who's right? Actually, nobody's right. Jew, the Jewish people are actually right. In the book of Deuteronomy... Moses speaks to the people and he says, do you remember when I went up the mountain and I received from God the Ten Commandments? But Moses doesn't actually use the word commandment. He actually says, I received from God the Ten Words. Now go back and look at Genesis, or Exodus 20, verse 1. Look at, the, look at that first phrase. What does it say? God spoke all these words. That's right. Oh, I can read lips. That's awesome. So God spoke all these words. And what's the first word? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Jewish people say, yeah, that's, that's word number one. Word number two is, you shall have no other gods. Word number three is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Jews have them numbered correctly, I believe. Now, I'm not going to go back and try and you know, stage a coup and get the catechism changed that was written 500 years ago. But it does two things. Number one, it helps us remember, God is always a God of grace, and we never have earned our way into being God's people. And some people look at the Ten Commandments, they go, well, in the Old Testament, God said you have to keep the Ten Commandments if you want to be part of Israel. No. What does God say in verse 1? I brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. That's how you're my people. It's grace. It's mercy. It's rescue. Just like us. Okay. And, and that's really helpful, isn't it? Because people in the Old Testament weren't any better at keeping rules than you and I are. They were never saved by being good, just like we were never saved by being good. They were saved because God was merciful and he saved them. Same as us. Exactly the same as us. Okay, so you shall have no other gods. Letter A. This command means more than putting God first. For example, that would apply a second or a third. So a lot of people will you use a, an illustration like a pie, and you've got a, a, a pie cut into pieces, and they say, oh, I became a Christian, and so I have to put, like, going to church in there and maybe given a little of my time, I got to squeeze that into the pie of my life and there's hardly room. And, and that would imply that, you know, God's got his little corner. And on Sunday, I'm a Christian. Look at me. The rest of the week, I don't, I don't worry about it. And actually, God is to govern every aspect of our life. So instead of a, a pie, 
Think of a circle still, but think of a bicycle wheel. And in the middle, there's a hub. And every single spoke goes into that hub. God is saying, let me be your hub. Right? So, yes, come to worship on Sundays or whatever day of the week it is. Read your Bible. Yes. But when you go to school, I'm right there with you. When you go to work, I am right there with you. When you're exercising, yep, I'm there with you. I'm, I'm part of every aspect of your lives, right? And that's a good thing, right? Because this is the guy who rescued us from slavery to sin and death. He wants to go with us. Why would I say no to that? Other gods can be anything that takes the place of God in our lives. So uh, when I was a kid growing up, a lot of preachers said, oh, materialism, money, possessions. And that's very true. Um, and, and today, did you see how that changed? What, what, she, what is she bowing to down, down to here? Money, right? How about here? What is that? The iPhone God. Yes, the iPhone God, right. So I got a video to show here. Hopefully the audio comes through real good. This is a very perceptive video. So that's pretty interesting video, isn't it? And uh, it's so easy to get sucked into that world of just my day is my phone and my phone is my day. Uh, we, we are so uh, connected to technology and technology is a great tool, but we have to master it and not let it master us. And it's, it's very, very, it's something our family talks about. We talk about it with our kids. We work on it when we can. Sometimes we don't always do the best. So I just want to encourage you guys to pay attention to each other and love each other. And, you know, put that phone away, put the TV away, you know, at least once a day and look each other in the eye. It's just so important. Let us see. God was passionate that his people not make an image of any kind to try to represent him or, or worship any false God. Okay. And again, why? Because it's for our benefit. God's not insecure, but he knows that if we go worship other gods, it's, it's not going to go well for us. All right, second commandment, at least as we number them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. God's name is taken in vain when we use it to support a lie. And, and in this example, I think it wouldn't be so much that we'd actually say God's name. I mean, sometimes 
you know, as God is my witness, we might say that. But I think a lot of time it's like, well, you know, I've heard people say things, well, you know, I wouldn't lie, I'm a Christian. Okay, you better not be lying then. <laughs> um, and so when, or if people like our friends or neighbors know that we're believers, and then they find that we've been lying to them, you know, that's just, that really crushes uh, any kind of good witness for God. God's name is taken in vain when we use it in any careless way. Um, you know, that's the cursing, the swearing with God's name. It's so easy to do, you know, and, and again, I'm old enough to have watched a lot of TV over 40, 50 years. And my goodness, TV and movies have changed so much. Uh, when I was a kid, you, you would not say, uh, well, you would not use God's name swearing out loud or everybody would go, what are you doing? I remember when my son was in second grade, he came home and he said, yeah, I heard this today. Well, that was 10 years ago. It's amazing how it's changed. Uh, and, and so uh, it's easy to become accustomed to ourselves as Christians. We're in the car and somebody cuts us off, you know, and out of our mouths come some words um, that are using God's name in a careless way. And by the way, one of the very best ways, at least for me, that has helped me over the years is simply to specifically pray about that. Say, God, I'm, I'm struggling to use your name in the right way like I am now and praying to you. And, and I'm struggling in using it the wrong way. So that, that can be very helpful. The most condemned abuse of God's name is by false prophets pretending to speak for God. God hates it when, when people speak falsely uh, in, in his name. So the phrase there is false prophets to fill in. I'm going to pop up the verse. Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord. I'm against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare the Lord declares. And boy, this happens today, doesn't it? When, uh, when I, I don't watch a lot of daytime TV, but I've seen a little bit. And there are plenty of people who have said on daytime TV things like, all paths lead to God. You know, God, God would not make it so hard and so confusing. Well, he actually hasn't. There's a book you can read. If you read this book, it's very simple, easy to do, right? Um, and, and so they'll say, all religions go to God. Or like the coexist bumper sticker, right? That's a way of saying all religions are the same. But if you study Judaism and Hinduism and Christianity and Islam uh, and Mormonism, you're going to discover they're very different. And it's insulting to them to say you're all the same. Um, but yet people will say, well, this is what truth is. This is religious truth. And God really gets frustrated with that. Why? Because it keeps people away from trusting in Christ. Instead of misusing God's name, we are to call upon it in prayer, praise, and petition. So um, if you guys don't have one of these, I, I have some on my shelf somewhere. I have to find them. I want to make sure I give you, every family should have one of these. It's a catechism. Uh, Luther wrote a catechism. A catechism is just a little book of basics. And so Luther wrote a small catechism that had things like the Ten Commandments, the, the Creed, Baptism, the Lord's Supper, and so on. And what Luther wrote is this long, okay? So it's not very big, is it? It's 44 little pages. That's what Luther wrote. But since then, so many things have changed <laughs> that we now have an explanation that's this long. Now, don't let that intimidate you. The explanation is kind of like an encyclopedia. Do you remember encyclopedias? They were part of what was called books. Anyways, in an encyclopedia, you just look up the topic you want to look up. Now we just Google it. No, I'm not talking to you. So you would use a catechism to look up something in the book. Uh, for example, um, I'm just looking up something. Why was it necessary for our Savior to be true God? And so it answers that question in the explanation. So it's just a great handy little thing. So if you don't have one of these, I want to give you one. They're free. Um, pester me until I give you one. Uh, if I see you Sunday, I'll give you one. Really good books. Okay. We'll do the third commandment, and then we'll call it a night. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath, strictly speaking, means to rest or stop. And, and so Sabbath, God says, stop your work. Stop it. Rest. Uh, someone, uh, I was with a group of other pastors uh, a few years ago, and someone said something very wise. They said, 
we work so hard that we have to rest from our work. But the Bible teaches us to work from our rest. For example, if you go to Genesis 1 and uh, you read about the days of creation, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so it starts by talking, the beginning of the day is the evening. So right now for a Jew, um, Tuesday is beginning. And think about what that would be like if we started thinking, okay, what do I got to do today? Well, first thing I got to do is get some rest because my body's tired. Um, I had a slight medical procedure, very safe, very good. Everything's all fine. Uh, a few weeks ago, but I, 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 they had to give me some uh, anesthetic. <laughs> I came home. I had the most glorious nap of my life. I slept for five hours in the afternoon on a weekday. I was like, oh, yes. And then the effects kind of lasted. I slept for eight hours that night. The next morning, I got up. It's like, I can do anything. Anybody try and stop me, it won't work. I had so much energy. It was awesome. And so think about what our, our days would be like if we worked from rest rather than resting from work. Something to think about because I'm, I'm, I can be bad at that. Okay, so where did we get our idea for a week? A day is one Earth rotation, right? We all know that from basic astronomy. A month, the Earth or the moon goes around uh, the Earth approximately every 28 and some days, right? A year, the Earth travels all the way around the sun in one year, right? So it's all astronomy. But where did we get a week? From the Bible. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, why did God rest? Was he tired? No, he's giving us a pattern. He says, I don't want you to work all the time. Now, the, the 10 words or 10 commandments are given both in Exodus, and we looked up them up in Exodus. In Deuteronomy 5, they're given again. I won't make you look that up now, but maybe look it up on your own for the third commandment. Because here in Exodus 20, the reason given is, well, God made everything in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. But there's an additional reason given in Deuteronomy 5, and it's this. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought you out, I think it says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So what is God saying about the Sabbath? Don't live like slaves. Slaves have to work seven days a week. You should not be doing that. So... I, I have said this to myself, and I'll say it to you. You and I should not work like crazy seven days a week. And by work, I don't just mean your job that maybe you get paid for, but also the work you do at home. There's always stuff to do there, right? Not just meals and, and think about laundry. It always needs to be done. And then there's the repair jobs. You know, that sink is leaking or the floor needs repair or, gosh, we haven't painted the house for nine years. Got to paint the house. It just never ends. And so God would say, don't live like a slave. Don't work. Let's say, let's say you have a job you work at five days a week. And then you come home and on Saturday you work on mowing the grass, fixing things in the house, laundry, cooking. Well, on Sunday then, by all means, stop. Rest. Don't be a slave. And we volunteer for slavery because we, we Americans like to be efficient and get things done. The Sabbath was to be kept holy. Our word holiday simply comes from observing a holy day, taking a time off from work for worship. Now, remember, I'll say this many times, the word holy does not mean sinless or righteous. The word holy means set apart for service to God. Set apart for service to God. And so when God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, he's saying, set it apart, don't work. And so... It's not because we remember again, Jesus canceled the written code. We're not bound by the old covenant, the old Testament where it says, don't do any work at all. In fact, Jesus in the new Testament says, don't you give your donkey water to drink on the Sabbath? It's okay. But on the other hand, I, I think it, it's good for us not to go too far with that and still rest, keep it separate worship. And then what is restful for you? Maybe as a family for you guys, it might be sitting around and laughing and talking. Uh, maybe restful for some people is gardening. I find it not restful at all. It's work and I don't like it. Don't ever give me a plant, please. Okay, I'll kill it. Not intentionally. I'll just, I have a black thumb. I'll kill it. But for me, that would be work. If like, oh, I got to mow the grass. But for some people that might be 
I'm, I'm out pruning the flowers. I'm just so relaxed. I've been wanting to do this all week. Well, that's okay then. You're not working. So you have to look at it that way as well, okay? And supernatural strength comes from supernatural rest. Okay, so again, if I'm the only, the rest I really need is the forgiveness of my sins. I can only find that when I worship, right? Whether I'm at worshiping at home or at church. So uh, I'll have guys tell me, yeah, I, I like to hunt or I, I love to fish myself, but I'll say, I, I worship God out in nature. No, you don't. You're worshiping yourself, right? I know. I do it myself when I fish. It's like, woohoo, this is awesome. And is it relaxing? Yes. But I still need to hear the word of God preached in my ear. I can't receive the Lord's Supper when I'm out in my boat. Now, I could get baptized if I fall over, so I'll give them that, okay? But you can't worship when you're out hunting or, or fishing. Now, what I will say is I've gone on trips like with my brothers where we're out in the middle of nowhere. What I do is Saturday night, I, I go, guys, let's just have a little worship thing. And we open our Bible. We read a little bit. I'm a pastor, so I'll say a few words. It doesn't have to be in exactly an hour. It can be 15 minutes. But we're remembering the Sabbath. We're getting that spiritual rest, the forgiveness of our sins that we need so much. Letter B, Jesus freed us from too narrow an interpretation. I already mentioned that. Number one. The early church used this freedom to worship on Sunday because it was the day Christ rose from the dead. So very early on, they recognized they don't have to literally worship on Saturday anymore, like the Old Covenant says, because we're New Covenant people, and Jesus canceled the written code. And so they moved to Sunday because it was the day Jesus rose from the dead. Paul instructed the church in every age not to judge each other about how or when we should worship. And there's that Colossians 2. Colossians 2 is a great chapter, by the way. It starts by talking about how Jesus is the Son of God in the flesh. And then it moves on to all these really practical, helpful things about baptism and then about the commandments and worship especially. So it's really good stuff. And so you can worship on Saturday. Yes, you can worship on Sunday. Yes, you can worship on Monday or Tuesday. I'm starting to sound like a Dr. Zeus book, aren't I? That's really frightening. Okay, I'll stop. Right. Okay, so that's where we're going to quit tonight. So whatever page that is, uh, we'll pick up with the fourth commandment about honoring your father and your mother. Any questions about the law or the commandments before we close tonight? <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank and praise you for the learning we've done this evening. I ask you to bless each family, each person, with especially the confident knowledge that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you love us dearly and you will give us eternal life. Help that, help that then to give us a great focus for living as your children tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Pastor. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay. Bye.